has revealed many things to man in many ways. In addition to the written word of the Bible, we learn from creation itself and from the archaeological record of past civilizations. This series is designed to open your understanding to many truths, some of which may be new to you. Allow the Holy Spirit, or Spirit of Truth, and the Word of God to be your guide. This series is narrated by Paul H. Johnson. Petra, the rose-red city, half as old as time. One of the most mysterious, fascinating, and most beautiful of all the ancient biblical sites is Petra, known in the scriptures during the time of Abraham as Selah. So perfectly concealed among the rose-red cliffs of Edom, this amazingly preserved city of Petra remained lost and almost forgotten for over a thousand years. Nestled in a craggy canyon of red, pink, white, brown, and violet rock, the city is practically invisible from the air and impregnable from the ground. Its natural caves that honeycomb the area were once home to man thousands of years before recorded history began. Hand axes were found in a rock shelter, together with other flint implements dating from the upper Paleolithic period around 10,000 B.C. During the early Neolithic period, 8,000 to 4,500 B.C., several Neolithic villages were established in areas close to Petra. Of the subsequent periods, the Chalcolithic and Bronze Ages, nothing is known of its history until the Iron Age, known as the Israelite period, when the country became known as Edom. Documented history of Petra appears for the first time in the scriptures in the time of Abraham where Petra is referred to as Mount Seir, the home of the Horite cave dwellers. Genesis chapter 14 verse 6 reads, And the Horites in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And in chapter 36 verse 20, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land. The Horites, or Nusians, as they were known by historians, occupied not only Petra, but a wide area from the territory south of the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. When Jacob returned home from Paddan Aram to Canaan, he and his brother Esau were reconciled. Jacob was left in possession of Canaan, while Esau moved south and began to drive out the Horites from Mount Seir. The destruction of the Horites by the children of Esau is found in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 12, which reads, The Horites also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them when they had destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead as Israel did unto the land of his possession, which the Lord gave unto them. Esau established the kingdom of Edom, and his descendants became known as Edomites. The Edomite kingdom was blessed with fertility and cultivation in the earliest times as implied in the blessing of Esau, whose dwelling was to be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of the heaven from above as recorded in Genesis chapter 27, verse 39. The Edomites made Petra their capital under the name of Selah, meaning rock. Numbers chapter 20 records how the Edomites, a family of Edom, became powerful enough to resist the children of Israel from passing through their land when coming out of Egypt in 1453 B.C. They were refused passage and a second appeal by the Israelites produced a show of force on the part of the Edomites, and Israel was forced to go round the borders of Edom. After the Israelites had settled in their allotted territories in Palestine, the Edomites raided them on a regular basis for several centuries. The books of Joshua, Judges, and 1 Samuel record the conquests of Palestine by the tribes of Israel, their failure to drive out the inhabitants of the areas that had been allotted to them, 
how they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtoreth, the mother goddess, and how they took foreign wives and served their gods. Time after time the children of Israel repented, and the Lord heard their pleas for help, and they prospered, but then they repeated their evil ways. As a result, they had to fight the Canaanites, Amalekites, Moabites, Midianites, Philistines, and Edomites for centuries, as they had been warned. Moving ahead in history to the time of King Saul, we find peace prevailed during his reign as king of Israel, when the future king David found safety in the wilderness of Maon in Edom, as recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 25. Later, when David, on becoming king for reasons unknown, showed no gratitude toward the Edomites, promptly invaded Moab and Edom, exterminating two-thirds of the Edomites. He then left his general Joab to massacre every male Edomite he could find. Admittedly, the Edomites had been raiding Palestine on a regular basis for many years, but the ferocity of David's attack seemed somewhat extreme. To commemorate his victory over the Edomites, David composed a song of triumph, the 60th Psalm. However, when the tables were eventually turned, the Edomites retaliated with their own song of triumph. After his victory over the Edomites, the scriptures record David's occupation of Edom. Reading from 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 14. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all Edom became David's servants. Although decimated in numbers, the Edomite kingdom remained for about 150 years in a continual state of hostility with the Hebrews, and in particular Judah. The Edomites periodically made ferocious and unrelenting attacks against the Judeans, regaining their independence for short periods of time. During the reign of Amaziah, king of Judah, between 796 to 781 B.C., a raiding party of Edomites were marauding and pillaging in southern Palestine. They were confronted by an army detachment led by King Amaziah, which completely routed them, pursuing them back to their Petra stronghold and taking it by force. The account of Amaziah's victory over the Edomites is recorded in two passages of Scripture. Reading from 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 7, He slew of Edom in the valley of Salt ten thousand, and took Selah, that is Petra, by war, and called the name of it Jachtil unto this day. And reading from 2 Chronicles chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, and Amaziah strengthened himself, and led forth his people, and went to the valley of Salt, and smote of the children of Seir ten thousand. And the other ten thousand left alive did the children of Judah carry away captive, and brought them unto the top of the rock, and cast them down from the top of the rock, and they were all broken in pieces. It should be pointed out that the Hebrew word alaf, meaning thousands, can also be translated as families or clans or tents, meaning tented families. There are several instances in the Bible where the translators opted for the most spectacular number, but on reading the context in which they appear, one becomes aware that one of the other meanings would fit much more sensibly and appropriately. An example is the number of persons led by Moses in the Exodus. Any of the acceptable alternate meanings would have reduced the number to a more realistically sized company. The destruction of the Edomites by King Amaziah of Judah is believed to be a partial fulfillment of the prophecy of Obadiah concerning Edom. We read in Obadiah's single chapter, verses 3 and 4. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose inhabitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? 
Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence I will bring thee down, saith the Lord. And continuing in verses 8 to 10, Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom, and understanding out of Edom, and understanding out of the mount of Esau, and thy mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed, to the end that every one of the mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off for ever. Although it is often implied by Bible scholars that this battle recorded by Obadiah meant the near destruction of the Edomite race, this was not the case. There were many other Edomite communities that were left to fight the Judean another day. History has shown us that a defeated nation seldom, if ever, becomes completely extinct. Usually a considerable proportion of the population survive to build a new life in a new territory where its natural characteristics continue to be seen in a new generation. Years later, although they had no hand in the attack against the city of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the children of Esau gloated over the destruction of Jerusalem. They joined in the sack of the city, and with great cruelty slaughtered some of the fugitives. Jerusalem was seen as a symbol of Judean tyranny to the Edomites, and they reveled in seeing it destroyed. They produced their own song of triumph, with the words, Down with it, down with it, even to the ground, which they sang jubilantly. The Israelites were to remember the humiliation. In the prophetic 137th Psalm, the Israelites called to God, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundations thereof. After the captivity of the Judeans taken to Babylon, the land of Judah lay empty and unprotected but for a few peasants. The Edomites needed no invitation to leave their inhospitable hills and take possession of their enemy's land. They came, few at a time, as though not daring to believe their good fortune. However, when it became clear that there were no obstacles to overcome, others in great numbers flooded in. They took possession of Hebron and other towns in southern Palestine. For a complete account of the captivities and migrations of Israel and the return of Judah to their homeland, read the missing links discovered in Assyrian tablets by E. Raymond Capt. While the Edomites were moving from Petra into Judea following the fall of Jerusalem, whose inhabitants were taken captive to Babylon, another migration was slowly picking up pace. A people known as Nabataeans were moving from the area of modern Saudi Arabia where they had lived a pastoral nomadic lifestyle into the old Edomite kingdom. These were Bedouin people of ancient Arabia who sprang from Ishmael, one of the sons of Abraham by Sarah's handmaiden Hagar. Instead of driving out the remaining Edomites, whose kingdom had been weakened by continuous warfare with the Israelite kings of Judah, they were simply integrated with them. In the land of Judah, the Edomites and the Nabataeans set up a new kingdom of Edom, which the Greeks called Idumea, a corruption of Edomian. This nation of Edom included the people known as Amalek, against whom God set his face. Reading from Exodus chapter 17, verse 16. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. The Amalekites and the Edomites were both descendants of Esau, who hated his brother Jacob. Josephus tells how Isaac's son Esau left the land of his father and dwelt among the Horites in the cities of Seir, and ruled over the inhabitants who became known as Edomites and Idumeans, as the Greeks called them. In about 500 B.C., after Babylon had fallen to the Persians, the captive Judeans were released from captivity 
and allowed to return to Palestine. However, of the hundreds and thousands originally taken captive, less than 50,000 accepted the invitation to return to the city of Jerusalem. It is this remnant that became known as the Jews, a word meaning remnant of Judah, never having been applied to any branch of the Semitic peoples prior to the Babylonian captivity. The arrival of the Judeans triggered conflicts with the Edomites who occupied the Judean homeland during Judah's sojourn in Babylon. At first they plagued each other with raids, but ultimately the returning Judeans were strong enough to become the dominant force in Palestine. Between 135 to 105 B.C., the complete subjection of the Edomites came about when John Hyrcanus crushed all Edomite resistance and forced them to integrate into not only the new Jewish state, but also into the Hebrew religion, the word Jewish originally meaning remnant of Judah. Josephus records this assimilation of the Edomites into the Judean nation. In his book 13, chapter 9, he writes, Hyrcanus took Dora and Marissa, cities of Idumea, and subdued all the Idumeans, and they submitted to the use of circumcision and the rest of the Jewish ways of living, at which time, therefore, this befell them that they were hereafter no other than Jews. From that day forward, the name Jew could mean either an Israelite Judean or a non-racial Israelite, a fact that causes so much misunderstanding of Bible prophecy. This confusion started about 125 years before Christ and has continued to this day. It should be pointed out that the Idumean Esau Edomites were unwilling to convert to Judaism, and whenever the opportunity presented itself, they either speedily cast off a faith for which they had only a natural antipathy or deformed it and substantially contributed to the rise of a false Judaism. It is perhaps only logical that as descendants of Esau, they should resent the loss to Israel of what once appeared to have been their birthright and should aspire dominion for themselves. The racial Israelites, on the other hand, clung tenaciously to all that was Hebrew. This is especially true of those Judean Israelites who later became the disciples of Christ. It was they who opposed the acceptance of Hellenism into the mainstream of their Hebrew religion, whereas the Idumean Edomites embraced it and sought to substitute it for the ancient Hebrew religion. Although the merger of the Edomites into the nation of Israel was the end of the Edomites as a distinct people in Palestine, their influence was to continue to plague the Judeans and eventually to bring down the downfall of the house of Judah. The new Idumean converts, now a legalized part of the new Jewish nation, began to seize power by any and all means at their disposal. The house of Hyrcanus itself was finally deposed by the Idumean counselor Antipater, who called in the help of the Nabataeans. The Idumeans remained in power in Hebrew life throughout the time of Christ. Undoubtedly they were the ones of whom Jesus had in mind when asked why he spoke in parables. Reading from Matthew chapter 13 and verses 11 to 14. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall it be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. No doubt it was Idumeans John reported Jesus speaking to, as he wrote in chapter 10, verses 26 to 28. But ye believe not, because ye are not my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, 
neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. By the late 4th century B.C., the Nabataeans had established themselves as the dominant power in the impregnable valley of Wadi Musa, known as Petra. For more than 500 years, they were to control the desert trade routes that converged on Petra, the north and south routes through Damascus, and the east and west routes. The famous frankincense route from the Yemen to Gaza also passed through the kingdom of Petra, as well as equally important caravan routes between Man and Basra in Mesopotamia that crossed Petra. Such wealth became the envy of her neighboring countries. In 63 BC, Pompey of Rome sent an expeditionary force to seize control of Petra. In its fortress-like setting, surrounded by rugged sandstone mountains, the inhabitants of Petra were able to hold off the invasion of their city. The Romans found it too difficult to move their army through the narrow, over a mile-long ravine known as the Seek, which ranged from 10 to 30 feet wide, with side walls of over 150 feet in height, which was the only natural way into the metropolis of Petra. Defenders stationed along the tops of the cliffs could wreak havoc on any invading army by just shooting arrows downwards, or spears, or just rock missiles. Between 30 to 9 BC, another army sent by Rome also failed to take over Petra. However, later, when nearly all the caravan cities had fallen to the Romans, Petra was forced to yield to the Roman power, and Petra itself became the provincial capital of the new Roman colony of Arabia Petria, or Rocky Arabia. When the trade routes were changed by Rome to favor the whole vast empire rather than the merchants of Petra, many tradesmen moved away to new pastures of wealth. The role of taxes also contributed to the loss of trade. It was the taxes imposed on all trade through Petra, coming in all directions, that provided the wealth that sustained the city on a grandois scale for centuries. It is a fact, even in modern times, that when a government finds out how easy it is to raise money by taxes whenever they need more revenue, they just institute taxes. This the Nabataean Edomites did. Faced with ever-increasing taxes, the caravan trade from Egypt to Damascus and the Euphrates was diverted to the coastal routes, bypassing Petra. After hundreds of years depending on food and taxes coming in from the outside, the population could not exist on what they could grow, so an exodus began. It could be said the inhabitants of Petra just taxed themselves out of business. Is there a lesson in Petra for us today? Today Petra's once fertile valleys are covered by sand from the desert and debris from the soft rock of which the mountains are composed. Petra's springs and streams have dried up to such an extent that much of the area is incapable of supporting life. Only a few isolated places can be found containing enough vegetation and water to sustain the few Bedouin Arabs with their flocks of goats and sheep that call Petra their home. All this is exactly as foretold by the prophet Ezekiel in his 35th chapter, verses 1 to 4, which read, Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, and prophesy against it, and say unto it, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against them, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Why Petra was so cursed by God is told to us in verse 5. Because thou had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Then continuing on in verses 7 to 9, the prophet makes God's judgment even more pronounced on Petra, identified today as Seir. Thus I will make Mount Seir most desolate, and cut off from it him that passeth out and him that returneth. And I will fill his mountains with slain men in thy hills, and in thy valleys, 
and in all thy rivers they shall fall, that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. How much more clearly could God say it? How more definite could the prophecies be written? And yet some Bible teachers on prophecy try to circumvent God's words and judgments based on a single verse, namely Daniel chapter 11, verse 41, which reads, These shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Upon that single verse has been woven an erroneous teaching that Petra will be the so-called hiding place of safety of the modern Jews from an antichrist during a great tribulation to occur in the last days of this world order. That is, they say, the great tribulation recorded in the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. If this happens, then God is made out a liar, and we know He is not. He speaks only the truth, and His prophetic words can be seen to be literally fulfilled. Today, Petra's streets are deserted. Its homes, once bustling with life, are empty. Caravans laden with riches of the east no longer tread the seek. Them that passed out and them that returned no longer come and go. Silence pervade where once roaring crowds cheered their favorite gladiators. Petra teaches us that God is faithful to his word. Once he says a thing, it will come to pass. We can have faith in his word. You have enjoyed today's lesson in this series of studies in biblical antiquities covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding of the biblical text and the historical events it records. Welcome to Biblical Antiquities, a series